Well, hello, good evening, welcome to Holy Trinity Platt. Uh, my name is Tim. It is wonderful to welcome you all to our carol service this evening. Uh, yeah, and my name's Sarah. I'd like to echo that warm welcome. I wonder if you are feeling Christmassy yet. I imagine with only a week to go, you're feeling more Christmassy uh, day by day. Uh, the shops have been full of Christmas things for a long time, haven't they? They've been playing the music. You know, all I want for Christmas is you. I wish it could be Christmas every day. You may love them, you may hate them, but they do get us in the Christmassy mood. Love them or hate them, you've definitely heard them. That is true. Um, <laughs> and I wonder whether there is a song or something like that that makes you feel, oh yeah, Christmas is coming, it's just around the corner. But when I was growing up, it was the Coca-Cola advert. Don't know if you remember it. The holidays are coming. That's when I knew. Uh, these days, it's probably when you uh, light the advent candle for the first time uh, or something like that. That makes you feel really into the Christmas spirit. Yeah, I love the lights. I love the decorations. But I always come back to the music. So for me, Christmas is Christmas when I've heard Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. That's when I know it's all begun. Yeah, if music is part of what makes Christmas Christmas for you, then you are in for a treat tonight. As you can see, we have a wonderful choir and orchestra, and we'll be able to enjoy them playing and sing along uh, with the carols. And here again, the wonderful story of Christmas told in readings, prayers, and song. Uh, the service will proceed unannounced, uh, so you can follow along in your order of service, and hopefully you've got a copy. Uh, and if you're watching us on the uh, stream online, the words will be on the screen. Uh, though please do stand if you're able for the carols, but do remain seated for the um, choir pieces and for the readings and for the talk. And uh, as we begin, let's pray. At Christmas time, we delight again to hear the story of the journey to Bethlehem. The song of the angels, the surprise of the shepherds, and their joy as they found Jesus in the manger. But lest we forget, he was born to poverty. We remember at this season all who are hungry or cold. And lest we forget, he became a refugee. We remember the stranger and the lonely among us. And lest we forget, he felt the pain of life and death. We remember now those who are ill or anxious or bereaved. And because we know he came for our salvation, let us in heart and mind go once again to Bethlehem to hear the message of the angels and worship afresh the Son of God. Amen. Amen.
the chapter um, I will be reading first in Ukrainian, uh, and then uh, after that it will be read in English. So it's Isaiah uh, chapter 9, uh, verse from 2 to 7. From 2 to 7. Народ, який в темряві ходить, світло велике побачить, і над тим, хто сидить у краю тіні смерті, світло засяє над ними. Ти помножиш народ цей, ти збільшиш йому радість. Вони перед лицем твоїм будуть радіти, як радіють в жнива, як тішаться в час, коли ділять здобич. Бо зламав ти ярмо тягару його, і кия з рамена його». Жезла його пригнобителя, як затнів Мадіама. Усякий чобіт військовий, що гуляє гучно, та одежа, поплямлена кров'ю, стане все це пожежою, за їжу вогню. Бо дитя народилося нам, даний нам син, і влада на раменах його, і кликнуть йому ім'я. Дивний порадник, Бог сильний, отець вічності, князь миру. Без кінця буде множитись панування та мир на троні Давида і у царстві його. Бо поставили міцно його, щоб підперти його правосуддям та правдою. Відтепер і аж навіки ревність Господа Саваофа це зробить». The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
Our second reading is from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will, call, he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in a sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her.
reading is taken from Matthew chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate his marriage with her until she had given birth to a son and she named him Jesus.
are going to have an uh, interview now with Helena, who did one of our earlier readings. So tell us a little bit about who you are and kind of what you're doing in Manchester, where you're from. Just introduce yourself. My name is Helena. I came uh, here, uh, I fled from Ukraine because of the war, and I came in the plot uh, last May. So I, was, I have been here almost, uh, yeah, in May it will be a year. So I was blessed by opportunity to be hosted by Christian family in Glossop. Uh, and then I moved to Manchester. So this is going to be your first British Christmas. And there'll be some things about it that I'm sure are very different and some things are the same. But tell us a little bit about something that you love about a Ukrainian Christmas that maybe is, well, maybe different to how we celebrate here. Yeah. So uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian Christmas also have a lot of traditions. And uh, so where is, uh, there is a tradition of fasting before the Christmas. And then in, in the Christmas Eve, you can eat only when the, you will see the first star, uh, star on the sky. And uh, you should have, uh, traditionally, you should have uh, 12 dishes. There should be none, uh, there should be no dairy or products or meat and um, then you should this have this 12 um, 12 dishes uh, they represent 12 of apostles and then people are usually gathered together uh, in the rural rural areas and they're going from home to home singing carols they are very like carols in it's funny uh, but in Ukrainian language is very similar to English pronunciation it's kalatki uh, so uh, carols and kalatki I think it's similar and it's a very fun tradition I think I like the idea of 12 courses or 12 dishes. I don't like the idea of fasting for the whole day beforehand. <laughs> but maybe it would be good for me. Yeah. Um, so you're here because life is not as you would like it to be in Ukraine. Life has been very difficult and different at the moment. And yet we've been thinking on the front of our kind of carol, uh, Christmas card this year, we've got the words good news, great joy for all people. What does that mean for you at this time as you get ready to spend a Christmas out of your home country, away from family and with lots of things going on? How does that bring you any hope or encouragement at this time? Um, I was thinking about that and I was reading one of the uh, posts of my friend. So he said that uh, like we all hear like only the dreadful news about what is uh, future holds for Ukraine. We know that our, um, our enemy is very deceitful and Ukraine is bleeding right now. But he also, uh, like amidst, um, amidst this uh, bad news, um, he remind uh, he remind uh, himself and me about this um, Lord of the Rings story, and you know that during the, all the story, like the things are getting darker and darker, uh, but hobbits still uh, find the time to gather together, to have a meal, to enjoy their friendship, to build some plans even to, uh, to do something with their plans, you know. And it's always, I, don't, I think that's uh, the idea, or one of the idea of this um, story is there is no small task from God. All, like all tasks are meaningful. And also another thing, it's community. We, um, we have, in community, we have a hope, we have a sense of belongings, we share the values, and with these values we can change the world. And, um, and another thing, yeah, uh, in the end I would say that uh, Ukraine uh, have only hope in, in God, as the same as the rest of the world has the only hope in God. Only God can help us, so this is a great opportunity to celebrate this, that God is alive, that God is with us. So this Christmas, Ukrainians will still be meeting to celebrate Christmas, both in, there, in Ukraine and around the world, trusting in the hope of Jesus. Yes, and we will be praying about our country. Um, and then just a final, final question. We, we're singing a lot of carols, and I guess there are some carols you're familiar with. There may be some other Ukrainian carols that you sing as well. But is there a carol, particularly from this evening, that's got some words in it that kind of speak to you and, and encourage you in light of everything that's happening? Um, so we will hear this carol, this song actually later on, but I really like the words of it. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks our, um, the song uh, or of peace on earth, peace on earth, goodwill to man. Then um, peal the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead nor doth his sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. 
with peace on earth, peace on earth, good will to man. Very powerful words to think about and to pray in, not just for Ukraine, but for other places around the world where things are very difficult. Thank you very much. It's really lovely to hear from you. Thank you for sharing with us this Thank evening. Thank you very much.
the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time for the baby to be born. Sorry, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger.
The final reading is John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the life of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light, 
that gives life to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Good evening, folks. I hope you've been enjoying these uh, carols as much as I have. Some of you might be thinking, I didn't realise you could kind of dance along to some of them, but it's been great fun, hasn't it, to hear them so powerfully sung. I'm going to take us back, if I might, to one of the passages that uh, we looked at a little earlier. My name is Paul. If we've not spoken before, I'm the rector here. Uh, It's really good to be with you. That passage from uh, Matthew chapter 1, we'll think about just for a few minutes, if we might. Can I tell you, I'm feeling my age a little bit uh, these days. I'm of Generation X. I don't know whether some of you might fall into that. Some of you might be younger. Some of you might be older. And what defines Generation X, Generation X is probably is that we, we grew up watching Friends on a loop, pretty much. It was on every Saturday morning, uh, without fail. You could just watch it anytime you wanted, really. Uh, and I grew up with a real sort of affinity for one particular character, the character of Chandler. Uh, I think it was probably something to do with his uh, sense of insecurity, his sense of a, a using sense of humor as a defense mechanism. These kind of things appealed to me, uh, sort of taught me how to make my way through life. Uh, But obviously it was pretty sad this year, wasn't it, to hear of his death. And actually, I think I had made some assumptions about him that turned out not to be quite right. I think I'd assumed a a friend star living in that kind of environment. I assumed he would have had nothing to do with God and no interest, really. But I was surprised when the news came through. Actually, I read around a little bit. He'd actually written and spoken uh, quite a lot about faith, about prayer, about his sense of God and who he was. And I found myself surprised because I thought he was somebody who you'd think was, was just, you know, life would be him without God. But actually, it wasn't the case. And actually, I think, I don't know whether that's partly being Gen X, I don't know. But actually, my assumption often when I meet people is that just life is, it's us without God. But what I've noticed not only reading about him, but about a few others as well. Actually, there is something of a a movement back, a rediscovery, if you like, of who God is and that God, in fact, is with us. And it's something that I think Matthew, uh, in his account, when he tells us of what happened to Joseph, I think he's trying to draw our attention to that. And I wonder if I might just share with you a couple of thoughts. I guess asking the question, say you wanted to, how do you go from us without God to God with us. How do you do that? I think it has, from what Matthew says, something to do with your mind, it has something to do with your will, but ultimately it has something to do with his heart, God's heart. But it does have something to do with your mind, I think, first of all. So there are some very famous words that are said. When, you know the story, uh, perhaps that we had read there, Joseph, uh, he gets the news, Mary tells him uh, that she's pregnant, and he's pretty sure it's not his, so he's trying to figure out what to do. Uh, An angel comes to him, and in a dream, explains, actually, it's of the Holy Spirit. But then we're told some explanation, uh, famous words, that there was a prophecy once. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, explaining why this was happening. But do you notice it's not actually said to Joseph. Those words aren't for him. He doesn't hear them. We do. Matthew writes them to his first readers, to his readers later on, to you and me, saying, I need you to understand how this worked, and it's going to take a bit of a shift in your thinking, in your mind. They really wouldn't have been expecting this. God in the Old Testament is is vast, he's glorious, occasionally terrifying. He was a whirlwind to Job, he was a fire to Moses. 
Glorious, yes, but they weren't expecting this. And he's saying, you're going to need to shift and recalibrate your thinking about who God is and how he might reach you as a little baby with outstretched arms. He's asking for a paradigm shift. I came across the writing of um, a woman called Ayan Hershey Ali. Uh, she's a Somali academic at Stanford University. And I came across, she, there was a Times article published uh, not too long ago. She wrote called, Why I Am Now a Christian. I thought it was interesting. Now, the reason it was so interesting is really her own story. She grew up with a very authoritarian uh, sense of religion in Africa. And she describes the way she was never at ease with that. And over time, uh, about 20 years ago, she said she converted to atheism. Uh, She actually became friends with some of the great atheists of the day, uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and uh, and folks like that. And she describes, you can imagine there was a sense of relief for her. It brought a sense of freedom. You can imagine casting off the shackles of a, a very oppressive religion. What a great freedom it brought. And to her, it was a relief. But if you then go on those some 20 years or so that she was an atheist, somehow... That sense of freedom that she so valued and prized, she couldn't account for in her atheism. In fact, a number of things that she valued. To value the human dignity of everyone. To value freedom of conscience or freedom of expression. She said atheism ultimately couldn't explain to her why those mattered so much. Just to say, well, there's no God, wasn't really an answer. And so she's talking about a shift in her thinking that, yes, took some time, but took place. And so she comes to write an article, Why I Am Now a Christian, because she has found the answer to those things. The the reason that we have those values, she says, is rooted in a Christian understanding of the world. That's the kind of shift. And for some of us, it's in our minds. But it's also something in our will much more internal. I appreciate sometimes this is the harder thing to get at, our motivations and our our will, what's going on internally for us. Joseph, in the story, he's presented with this uh, incredible piece of information, uh, and the child is to be born of the Holy Spirit, to be called Jesus. He wakes from that dream. Now, what do you do at that point? He has to act on it or not. In fact, we're told he did as the angel commanded. So he went home and he took Mary. But you, you can't sort of sit on the fence with this one. I doubt Mary would have been very happy if he had. You either take Mary as your wife or you don't. You either act on it or you don't. And somewhere in there, it had to penetrate down to his will. But it involved him no longer calling the shots. Because obviously what he planned wasn't what he ended up doing. And at some point, he had to change what he thought he was going to do. Actually, it was a matter of his will. There's a a woman uh, writer, uh, Dorothy Sayers. She was writing around the time of the Second World War. Very sharp-thinking woman. Uh, Christian uh, uh, apologist who explains the Christian faith to the public. She talked about there being two kinds of laws in the world. Uh, one kind of law she described as the, the kind that you have uh, in, say, that governs sports. Say if you play cricket or football or something like that. You, we, we create a set of laws, don't we, to determine how things should work. Um, you might to take a, a modern example, not one that uh, she would have known, but VAR in football. Um, is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a set of rules that we've invented and, and a way that we, we work to, to determine how things go. And if you want to... You can change those rules. You can decide that you don't like them. Many people don't like VAR when things aren't going their way. Occasionally they do when it turns out that it is. But you can if you want to. You could extend them. You could take them away. You could say we're going to scrap the whole system. It's a set of laws that determine things that we can change. And then she says, but there's a different set of laws. And they contrast with that. She said, if whoever you are and wherever you are around the world, she uses this example. She says, if you put your hand in a fire, you'll get burnt. doesn't matter who you are. You can't change that law. It will happen to you. 
It doesn't matter what your background is. And she says, imagine those two sets of laws. We think to ourselves that God is like the first set. The God is like VAR. That it's there, we might use it, but we'd quite like to change it if need be, and perhaps we'll scrap the whole thing. And she says, that is where our wills come in. Because so long as we operate with that, that mindset, we'll think we are the one who calls the shots. And that change, if we're to engage with God with us, actually has to happen. It has to be a real convictional change. And actually reading around some of the uh, uh, folks like Iron Hershey Alley and others who are, are finding their way back to Christianity, a lot of them describe that convictional change. That actually they've, what they've run into is the way in which God has set up things in certain ways. That actually we can't just do away with them. That things that we do value, like freedom, like dignity, uh, like uh, a free conscience, they actually come from and are given to us by God. And there's a kind of conviction change. And actually, if you read and you follow some of those folks who are making that kind of change, actually where they land often is in worship. What they describe is finding their way back partly through worship. It's what we're doing here. When we gather together like this, when we sing uh, in this way, what we're, what we're saying is we come together and we're collectively saying, God, you are the one who calls the shots. We believe you are the one who is in charge, not us. And we're going to acknowledge that together. We're going to sing of it. And it's remarkable how much that convictional change takes a role in people finding their way back. I think it, for some of us, it is in the mind. We've got to think, actually, could God reach us? For some of us, it's, it's in here. Would we be willing to say that God might be there and could reach us? But ultimately, and, and finally, I think for, for all of us, really, it's, it's not so much what we do. It's more what he does. It's his heart that matters. I think God knows that we would all struggle without him. We try and dress it up in different ways, but we all struggle without him. In fact, if you were to stand back and, and, and say, well, you know, give me a sense, Paul, of what the story of the Bible is, I would say the Bible story is really a whole series of individuals who are struggling, messy people, whose lives are all over the place, and God frequently reaches into their lives and intervenes in them because he knows that they can't really do it without him. So the message of Christianity isn't you'd be better, you know, you've you just got to do a better job at finding God. Actually, the message at the heart of Christianity is he has reached into our broken and messy lives by becoming the human Jesus Christ. Let me come back to Matthew Perry. I've been reflecting on him. He's been in the news again this, this week, actually. He wrote these words. He said, whatever holes you're filling seem to keep opening back up. He says it's like whack-a-mole, uh, which is that game where you hit the uh, animals. It, it's, a, it's a very Chandler-like thing to say, I think. He says, maybe it's because I was always trying to fill a spiritual hole with a material thing. Now, he's right in lots of ways, isn't he? Often, I think, we have. We have what are really spiritual holes, and we are trying to fill them with material things. We're trying to fill them with things, or people, or relationships, or projects, or promotions, whatever it might be. And we're searching, and we're trying to fill those things. But in many ways, I think God would say to Matthew Perry, look, I know that's what you do. I know that you have a spiritual ache, you have a spiritual gap, and I know you're trying to do that. I know you're trying to fill it. And so I'm sending you my son as a living human being, as a material reality. I know you struggle in that way. So that's why I'm sending him to you. That's why I sent him to you. That's why he came as a person who would walk this earth This Christmas, I just wonder if some of you are trying to find your way back to God, and you don't quite know how. The more I read, the more I kind of encounter people, the more actually I, I wonder if there is a rediscovery happening. A way back from us without God being the assumption to actually, do you know, God is with us. 
And for some of you, it is in the mind. For some of you, it's wrestling with some of these big questions. Could God actually know us? How could I know? How could I trust that that would be possible? For some of us, many of us, it's in the will. It's really inside us. It's actually that reluctance to say, okay, what if you are there, God? What would it mean for me to admit that and to even begin to try and find out who you are? But for any and all of us, really, I don't think we'll grasp it fully until we see it's his heart for us, that he knows we struggle without him. So he came looking in the person of his son. This is how our next uh, song puts it. it. has that line, which actually um, Galena spoke earlier. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. God isn't dead. God is with us. And if you want him to be, this Christmas and beyond, he would be with you. Strong. 
It has been brilliant to have you all with us here this evening, those who are in the building, those who are watching online. I hope it has been a wonderful way to kick off your Christmas celebrations. And just to think through that idea, maybe you've always labored on that impression that, that God's asking you to climb up and reach up to him. And actually, as Paul was saying, it's his heart for us that he would come down, 
to be God with us. We want to say a big special thank you to Ollie and the musicians and all the tech team for all they've done this evening. I said at the beginning that Christmas doesn't start for me until the Herald Angels sing. It's not just any old Hark the Herald, it is this Hark the Herald. So now I know that Christmas has started. <laughs> I mean, my, my next line was going to say, please save your applause until the end. But never mind, we've, we've been there. It's lovely that people want to do it. Uh, yeah, thank you so much to everybody who's worked so hard over the last two Sundays to make this uh, such a wonderful time for us to get excited about Christmas and about God being with us here at Christmas. Please don't rush away at the end. There are refreshments served through there. We'd love you to stay around and chat uh, and just uh, you know, get to know people better. Um, if you would like to give anything, we do have a collection for Tear Fund, which are an organisation which work around the world uh, in situations where there is uh, lots of need in lots of different ways. Uh, you can give using the QR code in the back of your booklet, uh, using the card machines at both exits, but there's also a basket if you'd like to give cash as well. Perhaps tonight's given you a few things uh, to think about. Uh, as Paul was saying, for some of us, it, it is in the mind. We need to have that sort of gear shift in our thinking. Uh, or maybe it's in the will for you, but, but maybe you'd like to think a little more and reflect a little more deeply on some of the things that you've heard tonight. Uh, there are lots of ways you can do that. that we have some literature, some uh, free copies of an account of Jesus' life that look a bit like that, and some booklets that explain more about the Christmas message. These are free, so please, if you would like to, take one of those and take them away. Also, you can come up and talk to anyone you've seen up here. We'd, we'd love to chat to you uh, more if you have questions or things you'd want to talk about. Uh, and you're just really welcome to come and join us Sunday by Sunday. We meet to worship God uh, together. You'd always be welcome to do that, to come and find out more about our church's life and what we're all about. Uh, yeah, and you'd be welcome to join us over other services over Christmas. So next Sunday on Christmas Eve, we have a service at 10.30 and then a nativity service at 4 o'clock and a service, an all-age service as well on Christmas Day at 10.30. You'd be love, welcome to come to. They're all on our Christmas card. If you haven't had one, please again do grab one either at either door as you leave, which tells you all those different things. Um, we're going to have one more final piece uh, from the uh, orchestra and the choir before we finish. Uh, but we'd love to wish you a very happy Christmas, whatever you're doing. And let me pray as we bring our time to a close. The joy of the angels, the wonder of the shepherds, and the peace of the Christ child fill your heart this Christmas time, and the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.